know you've been kind of in Canada in and out the past, you know, almost, almost 20 years or so. Are you used to the winters yet up here? No. No, not yet. Hey. <laughs> I used to live the perfect life, man, being Mr. Texas summers. And so I missed the extreme heat and then I missed the extreme cold for the Canadian winters. So, right. yeah, now getting used to it. So, yeah, I don't think you can ever get used to it. It's way too cold. Is it, is it like, I guess in Canada, we have a perception that like Americans think, you know, that the, the winters are so cold here. Is it, does it live up to that, to that, you know, stereotype, I guess? Oh yeah. It gets way too cold. Yeah, I, it's, I wouldn't recommend it. No, no. If, if you can get out, try to get out if it's not for you. Oh yeah. What, what would I'm, you tell I'm actually heading to Arizona tomorrow. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just for like fa- family thing or, or yeah, business? Family get, a, family get away for a week. There you go. Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually playing a trip to Arizona as well this summer. I think the the Scottsdale area. Um, yeah, that's where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. We'll be in good year. So there you go. What would you tell 19 year old Nick Lewis if if you know you can go back in time and tell him that you know he'd be living in Canada for for 20 years, all time leading receiver in the CFL? What would 19 year old Nick Lewis say? If he knew it, or what would I tell him? Like if if you told him, you know, when you grow up, this is who you're going to be. I what wouldn't have believed it. No, 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 even close. I, I remember, I still remember the first time I was getting on a plane from Texas to Calgary and there was this older couple and they were like, you going to Calgary? I'm like, yeah. She's like, you play football? I was like, yeah. They're like, you ever been? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, we were just talking and they just basically told me Calgary split up into four quadrants. I had no idea what they were talking about. Now I understand because it's, it's Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, Southeast. And so Calgary's very divided like that. But overall, it was just like, I'm about to go up here and have some fun. I'm going to play football. And, and then I didn't really think I was going to be here for 14 years or however long. And it was just one year at a time, one day at a time, really. That was my mindset. Yeah. Was it a hard decision to leave home and, and come to, you know, I think it's it's different to leave home and go maybe up North in the States where you're kind of still in the same country. It probably has a different feeling than, than leaving to a, to a whole different country. Was that a tough decision to make or a tough transition? Oh no, no, I, no, not at all. I mean, I was ready to go. I'd left, I'd left home what three to four days after I graduated high school. And then after college, I was staying with my cousin and I was training. So I was projected fifth round draft pick to the Packers and I was training in Dallas. So I was staying with my cousin that whole off season. And then like three days before training camp, four days before training camp, I get a phone call from Matt Dunnigan inviting me to Calgary Stampeders uh, training camp. And I had a wedding to go to when my best friend's getting married the next day uh, on the 15th of May, went to that came back packed and I was off to Canada. Wow. So I guess, you know, you know, I guess it, down in the States, I don't want to, you know, harp on the CFL too much, but you know, I would assume that when you're playing college football in the States, your goal isn't to go to Canada. It's to go to, to the States, you know, to the NFL or some, you know, other league, I guess NFL would be, would be the highest league, I guess. Were you, were you excited to come to Canada? Were you kind of bummed out? Like what was your, your mindset coming to Canada? Was it a chance to prove yourself to to make it back to the States? Man, I was super excited. I, I'd watched, um, in 95, I'd watched, uh, the stands play in the gray cup. You know, I watched Doug Flutie play and I remember it being a snow game and everything. And, um, that was the only time I'd ever seen a CFL game, but with, with the whole way the NFL thing kind of happened, I mean, I was a division two walk on, so there wasn't like a lot of, Oh, I'm about to go play professional football. That wasn't even a thought process of mine. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of teammates. There were some teammates um, and there was some, uh, some opponents that would after the games be like, can't wait to watch you on TV next year. Mm-hmm. That was it. Like I didn't believe it. I always thought it was like a facade or, it was something that, well, maybe somebody's seeing something in me that I haven't seen because I was so far removed from that world. Like I've never been like the big football guy. Mm-hmm. I just love to compete. So mm-hmm. when I got the opportunity, you know, it was a great chance and uh, I took it. 
what was it like kind of coming into the, the, the dressing room or, or the team facilities for the first time being, you know, quote unquote outsider, maybe, cause there's, you know, maybe a lot of guys that knew each other already. I would assume, you know, you kind of hear about stories in, in other professional leagues, for example, the NFL, where you kind of come into a team and you already know most of the players that are, that are there in some way or another. What was your experience like your first time in Calgary? Were you fi- maybe feeling a little bit lonely by yourself out there? Did you know a couple of the guys? I knew no one, man. Like, um, there's not a lot of people from Southern Arkansas in professional sports. I mean, Fred Perry uh, was with Calgary at the time. Uh, but when I got there, it was just the rookie camp. So the vets wasn't even there. And then I kind of I hung out with Fred when he arrived uh, one night and hung out with some of the vets and got to know some people. Uh, one of my close friends still to this day ended up being my roommate, my rookie year, Salacio Sanford. And yeah, we, we clicked right away and they told us one of us was going to make the team and one of us wasn't. Uh, but we both ended up making the team and we just went out and competed and balled every day. So yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't this like big thing where I knew anybody, I didn't know anybody in the league. Wasn't just like I didn't know anybody on the team. I didn't know anybody in the league. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd seen people play on TV. I was fans of certain players and from watching them play in the NFL or college. But other than that, it was, you know, I, I'm a huge Longhorn fan, University of Texas. So seeing Wayne McGarity was huge to me because I'd watched him play all his years at University of Texas and all these other things. And Albert Connell, who went to Texas A&M, my family's big uh, A&M fan. So being able to see uh, Albert Connell and Wayne McGarity and these guys was just like, dude, this is crazy. Like, I just look around sometimes and be like, this is actually pretty cool to be out here. But it motivated me because I was like, I'm going to show them that I'm on the same level as them. And it was a great motivating factor. And you, you know, you did like, you know, and obviously an awesome job showing how, how much of a level you were obviously getting rookie of the year, your first year. And then, you know, a whole bunch of all-stars following as a CFL player, do you, was there a struggle between wanting to stay in the league and wanting to, to trial for the NFL? Is, is there kind of like a back and forth there in your mindset? Or was there a point in time where you kind of just thought, you know what, I like the CFL. I like Calgary. I'm just going to, you know, just make my living here. Well, going from uh, a rookie of the year, my first year, uh, number two receiver in my second year in the league. And um, Ted Heller, the owner, one of the owners, one of the 12 owners we had, he was the most active owner, the more hands on. And Jim Barker, who's there in Hamilton now, mm-hmm. had brought me in and, and basically said, 12 NFL teams want you. Uh, Barker was saying he was good friends with Tom Brady's agent at the time. And, you know, that basically I could go wherever to one of the 12 teams. I had an agent that knew everybody. So I was going to be taken care of. And they wanted to look out for me and make sure I was good. Um, but at the same time, they they said, you know, is there any chance you would stay in Calgary? And I had loved the CFL. I'd love Canada. I knew in the back of my mind I wasn't the prototypical uh, receiver being uh, 5'10", 197, 100, uh, 200 pounds at the time. I knew I wasn't a prototypical guy. And, you know, right after that, that's when Wes Welker and, and those guys started really started doing more for the smaller receiver. And I realized that if I would have took that opportunity, I would have been a part of that first group in that era of smaller receivers really doing big things um, in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you, do you look back on some things like that, for example, with, with any sort of regret or, or do you just kind of, you know, just be grateful for any opportunity you have? And, and if there is any, any kind of ounce of regret, how do you kind of make peace with it? through any part of your career, really best decision I ever made was staying in Canada. Mm -hmm. Like I I firmly believe that because even though, like I said, that era where those smaller receivers were doing a lot of things, I mean, there's still a lot of small receivers and you can only name a handful. Right. Right. So I know that like I put like this, I feel like I'm more athletic than those guys, Mm -hmm. but those guys had a great opportunity and they did well with what they did. Um, I I made my decision. I sit back. I didn't make a decision that day. It took me a couple of days, but growing up, my goal was never to play in the NFL. I was more basketball. I would rather play in the NBA. 
But same time, when you look at it, I'm like, NFL is not even that like big to me. And it wasn't a big goal of mine to say I played in the NFL. Uh, my brothers and the kids, other kids around that uh, my brother's age, who's who's 26 now, but all of them, they were like, dude, how do you pass up the NFL? Like, how do you turn down the NFL? Like, people didn't understand it. Right. Because to them, this is everybody's goal is go to the NFL. But, I mean, I realized that, dude, I'm playing professional football. I'm having a blast. I love Canada. And the game in the CFL fit me and my style of play so well, I feel like it would have been dumb to take that opportunity. I think a lot of things in football, especially football, but in sports in general, a lot of the lessons or things you go through apply to real life. And what it kind of sounds like there is kind of the old adage of, you know, you, you need a passion for what you do. It's not just about the money or the fame for what you're doing. It's about if, if you really love it. And it, I kind of see a bit of a comparison there where the NFL is a bit of a, you know, a glamour, glamour league where everybody kind of goes to for the most money and the most fame but somewhere like the CFL where maybe you had already developed those personal relationships with your teammates and coaches, you were used to the city, you were just having the time of your life, having fun playing football. That meant more to you than, than, you know, the fame and glory of the NFL. But you know, that's, um, that's the misconception that I try to teach people about. Um, there's 1700 players in the NFL. Uh, you probably only know 200 of them. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the biggest thing is like if you're going to the NFL for money or fame, it's not like it's everybody's making money or fame. Yes, you can make eight hundred thousand dollars in a year. You can make two million dollars in a year. But I promise you right now, you cannot retire off of one year at two million dollars. You can't retire off of four years at eight hundred thousand dollars. Like you still have to work after that, after right. taxes and lawyer fees and everything else you're only making about 50% of that, you know, 50 to 55% of that. So to think of it in a way of, Oh, passing up fame or fortune. I mean, it's a very rare group that does that. And if you look at the level of the type of people that make that most of them are quarterbacks, but then the ones that aren't quarterbacks, they're very specialized players. Mm -hmm. And it's a very rare few that make that type of money that they can actually retire after the game. I have hundreds of NFL friends and they respect me um, for what I did and, and what I, what I was doing at the time. But the the thing is, is that they work now. They right. played five and six years in NFL, but they work now. And it's the same thing. So we're all in the same boat. Um, so I, I, and that's the thing that I hate when people see the NFL and they see the money and they see the marketing. Yes, it's great money, but it's not sustainable over the rest of your life because, you know, when you sign up to play sports, you can only play for so long and right. you hope you can walk away when you want to walk away. And I was able to do that. I walk away on my own terms and, you know, I was still under contract. So um, I hadn't been released or anything. So I, I walked away on my own terms wanting to move into my second career. A lot of athletes struggle with that, you know, obviously is, is, you know, retiring and moving into their second career, whether it's, you know, they don't want to admit to themselves that they may or may not have the talent anymore, or they may not, they don't want to admit they don't have the love for the game anymore, or they're, they're scared of the money. You know, you kind of mentioned it there. You see a contract sign, you know, say four years, 40 million. So you think 10 million a year for an athlete, that's a lot of money, but Again, there's taxes, lower, lawyer fees. There's a bunch of people coming at you for you know loans or business opportunities. So that 10 million really isn't anywhere close to 10 million, probably. And for there's you, only there's only there's there's probably not even a hundred guys in the NFL making 10 million dollars a year. Right. Right. So that's the misconception of 1,700 players. Yeah, if you ever make it to the top 100, top 200, you have a great opportunity of making a lot of money. But if you don't make it that top 200 of the NFL, then you're still in the same boat as everybody else. And the average length of a CFL and NFL career is three years. So, you know, you get guys that come to the CFL all the time from the NFL. I've seen, I had a teammates that played six, seven years in the NFL, couldn't make the CFL roster, could barely. And I mean, these guys did not look like professional athletes, some of them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it goes both ways. The game's different. So it's going to, it's going to be a little different. So 
all the guys that come from the CFL to the NFL are not going to make it. And all the guys that come from the NFL to CFL won't make it either. Right. Right. You, you yourself, I mean, you had, you had a lot of seasons of success, your, your early years in, in the CFL. How did you kind of stay grounded with when all the success and hype and fame is coming towards you, whether it's, you know, the all-star appearances, the, the thousand yard seasons, the great cups, how did you kind of avoid getting caught up in it? Because that's another thing too, that a lot of people in, you know, CFL and NFL, I would say struggle with is they get a bit of success and they taste it. And, and that's all they, they try to taste after, right? They, they, you know, fail to stay grounded into who they are. Well, one, I really enjoyed it. So I allowed myself to have fun with it Two, come in, taking the road I took to the CFL. Um, and I always use the motto, everybody can do things I can't do just because I do it on TV. Doesn't make me any different or any better. You know, there was people mm-hmm. doing, you know, I, I was amazed. I, I, I remember one time pulling up to the uh, dry cleaners and I seen this guy washing a window and he did it so effectively and so well. I was amazed by that. And I was, and I was like, that dude takes his job seriously. So it was, it, that's the type of person that I am. It has nothing to do with what you do. It's how you do your job. If you take your job seriously and you have passion in what you do, um, do your job well. And for me, I loved it because I was a fan. I felt like I represented the fans because I was actually a fan playing the game. I just felt like I had the best seat in the house. And then it was like, when I'm on the field, let's go play. And it, it had nothing to do with me feeling like I'm better than people or, you know, anything like that, because I was never, I've never felt like that. I don't even get it. Like some people still come up to me and talk to me. I still don't get it half the time. Like mm-hmm. it, it just never clicked with me. <laughs> you mentioned the fans in the CFL and playing, playing for the fans and the CFL is, is they have a really unique fan. It's almost like a college football atmosphere in some stadiums when they're packed, you know, Saskatchewan, Calgary, Hamilton, like just to name a few, those are kind of Ottawa, even recently with the red blocks, like yeah. they're, they're really, really passionate fans. Speak about maybe what your perception of the CFL fans were kind of coming to the CFL. If, if you had any perception of the fans and maybe, you know, what you took away or how much it maybe, you know, you, you took away from the fans, um, you know, your first, you know, sellout game something or, or meeting fans on the street, for example. Well, I'm a big WWE, WWF guy. And <laughs> me too. It, and it was always the, the enjoyment. And that's where all the nicknames came from, but it was the enjoyment of going out there. And my mindset was always walking into a stadium. People are going to know me. Everyone in the stadium will know me by the end of this game. Mm-hmm. that was my mindset. It was, I didn't care about winning and losing. I didn't care about, I just said, everybody will know me. I was going to ball out. And through that, I felt like I gave the team the best chance to win when I had the ball in my hands. So at that point, and if I didn't get the ball, I was going to try to smack somebody because I came from an option offense where we ran the ball a lot. And we were only like, when I first got there, we only threw the ball 14 times a game. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where you're not getting a lot of passes and you have to make yourself still valuable within the offense. So how do you do that? You go block, you go help. And that's what I've done. And, you know, it just created the mindset of I'm going to be valuable with or without the ball, but everyone's going to know who I am every time I walk through this, uh, walk into a stadium. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you know, I think as athletes, we, we try it and kind of put ourselves in the best situations like you, like you are possible when you're on the field and have the most success, but sometimes success doesn't happen. You, you lose game, you make a bad play season ends earlier than you expected. How do you deal or how did you deal with any sort of, you know, adversity that, that you face on the football field? Early, I didn't deal with it well because I mean, especially at the end of the season, Right, we lost two double digit leads in 05 and 06 in the playoffs mm-hmm. to lose those games. So, for games that you felt like you should walk through it and come out the other side, you end up losing, and then it destroys you because I had built the persona and everything else that this gave me so much value in life that I'm going out here to rep my value. So, then when you lose the last game, to me personally, I didn't have any value until the next, next season. Right. So I'm going through that whole withdrawal. It's like, 
you know, it's like quitting cold Turkey. If you got an addiction, right. You're like, what's, what's going on. You're in shock. Your body's like, Oh, this is, you know, so you don't have any idea what you're going to do with yourself. You know, you got six more months, seven more months to get ready for another season, but you don't have any clue of how you're going to handle these next few months or whatever you're going to do with these months and, and everything like that. So, um, Ending the season was very hard for me early in my career. Mm-hmm. Later on, how did how were you, how did you kind of get better at dealing with those you know early exits or or something? Or how did you kind of you know handle not having or not feeling any value like you described earlier? How did you handle that better later on in your career? Uh, Two thousand eight, we got a chaplain named Rod Swarski, and and you know changed everything. Man, and just being able to, I've always had lived within my faith. Uh, but to really be around guys and we had a chapel group that was, you know, probably 15 guys, 16 guys deep. And it really made a huge difference when we share stories and share our backgrounds and our past and um, share the word of God and everything that really, it really hit home of where your value really is. And it made everything so much easier because I didn't need to win to be valuable anymore. I just wanted went, went out there and balled. So, it made it made the game a lot funner too. Yeah, and I wasn't playing like I used to be scared to get hurt and everything because it my value, but hey. it took a, it took everything away. So that must have helped. I I gotta imagine when when you fractured your fibula back in in 2013. Did I guess your mindset was already at a place then where you were able to deal with it a bit better? You know, the funny thing is, uh, like I'd always feared it, even with the even with chapel and everything, I still feared all of that. Right. I didn't want it to be taken away. Um, the day that I broke my leg, my fracture, my fibula and tore every ligament in my ankle. That was the first time I told God, you know, I give you 100% control, even though I don't have to tell him that he's got it anyway. But I was like, I trust you a hundred percent, whatever happens, happens. And I go out there in my first catch, I fractured my fibula and tore every ligament in my ankle. They didn't think I was going to play again. And, you know, it sucks because I was on my way to my four straight 1200 yard season and 10 straight thousand yard season. Um, I'd always joke with Don uh, Narcisse that I was coming for his 216 game catch record. And I was joking with G Roy, I was coming to get him and all these other things. And Terry Vaughn had 11 straight thousand yard seasons. And I was like, Oh, I'm about to get that too. Yeah. And, yeah. But but it all came crashing down. And, you know, a lot of it was like a lot of the pressure was off because I didn't have to be that guy anymore right now. And um, I was just competing to get better. And so it was, um, it was, a, it was one of those things that you go through, but I feel like it made me so much better, so much stronger. Yeah. And I definitely enjoyed the game so much more my last four years playing than I did uh, the previous 10. Yeah. Cause it almost makes you more grateful for, for the situation and the opportunity you're in. I kind of went through a similar epiphany, I guess. Um, I was training for, you know, maybe about four or five years ago, I was training for some powerlifting meets and I blew out my right, my right pectoral muscle bench pressing. And, you yeah. know, I was scared the whole time because, you know, an injury like that, if, if you get it, you're, you're done for a really long time bench pressing. I was always scared about being injured, being injured, don't get injured, don't get injured, stretch, stretch, stretch. And then, you know, one day just warming up lightweight, it just snapped on me. Felt heard like, or yeah, sounded like Velcro just, you know, tearing away in my chest. And I was really, really bummed out at first. I, you know, didn't want to leave the house. I was just so depressed. I couldn't lift. But then when I was able to lift again, really made me more grateful and, you know, take advantage of, of, you know, the gifts that I had or, or the lucky situation that I was in that be able to do what I love, which was lifting at the time. And, you know, I think that's a lot of athletes, you kind of got to go through it in order to have that epiphany. It's hard to have that epiphany without going through it, but sometimes injuries can be the best thing an athlete has just for, for their mindset. You're really forced to almost have some on the job training there uh, of really reworking your mind so that you can deal with any sort of adversity and, and just be grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of kids in like, even like make a wish and uh, you see, you see so many, and even people get to do these amazing things, but it's like they have to go through so much pain, so much heartache, so much time and effort just to get to that one moment, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of people want to do things and live things and 
and B, but a lot of people, <laughs> you, you wouldn't go through what I went through or a lot of people went through to be what they are. Right. Yeah. You kind of got to, you got to have those, those challenges growing up, you know, whether it's as a child or a teenager or both, whatever, to kind of frame your mindset so that when you're an adult, you're able to better thrive in situations. It's, it's pretty crazy. You know, a, a lot of people or athletes, I feel like, especially in, in football, they have so much adversity in, you know, their childhood and, and adolescence that I think that's, that's what makes them as motivated and as tough as they are to be able to excel in such a tough sport, like, like football, they've kind of already their mindset shifted a bit to kind of deal with the adversity and stand on their two feet and just, and just, you know, go forward with, with the next challenge. Yeah, um, they, made, they made their mind up early that they're going to overachieve. Right. They're going to achieve things and they're going to will themselves to be the best that they can be. You know, yeah, being the player that you were and with, with so much success and, and such, you know, such a, a really good mindset when it came to being a football player, how much of a, of a turn of events was it to you being a free agent after the, uh, the 2014 season? Was it something, was it a hard pill to swallow for you or was it, you know, kind of how you already went through that epiphany stage and you had your chapel group? Was it something that, you know, you just kind of looked up with the, uh, you know, half glass full approach? That was great. I mean, I went going to the Grey Cup that morning. I, I seen my my aunt, my wife, and I seen um, my dad. And I didn't take the bus to the game. I took the train in BC down to the game. It's, it comes out about a block away from the the stadium. So I just took the train down there with my music, and it's only like a one one or two stops. So didn't take very long. Then I walked to this facility and or the stadium and I was just looking around outside and I was prepared for that to be my last game. And I was at peace with that being my last game. Um, went through a lot of injuries. Uh, my ankle didn't really heal as well as I, it like I got cleared. They told me I wouldn't. Okay. After my ankle injury, they told me I wouldn't uh, jog for four months. I was cleared to play in less than three months. But when I came back ready to play, I got cleared right before the Western final. Huff was like, you can play next week in the Grey Cup. They said it was going to be impossible. So we already have our game plan or whatever. I'm like, cool. <laughs> we end up having six turnovers. We lose the Sask in 2013 in that Western final. You know, I could have played. And mm -hmm. like the, the fact that I – the fact that I kept telling him I was going to be cleared and the doctor kept telling him I wasn't. And then when the doctor cleared me, it just made this whole thing just, and I was like angry because I'd worked so hard for that moment. Like I'd seen that moment. I had dreamed about that moment being back on the field in the Western final. And I worked, worked, worked to get back there. I remember the, uh, I remember the video, sorry, where it was like a month in and you were like pretending to be on your crutches and then you just like threw your crutches to the side. And, and I was like, wow, this guy like really went through a lot of rehab in one month to be able to walk. Like, it looks like nothing was wrong with him anymore. Like he just didn't have a fractured fibula or, or an ankle injury or whatever. Dude. I, and I tore, they were like, man, you tore so much cause the force, they said it should have torn my ACL and everything as well. But since my legs were so big, it protected it because it tore the ligament that runs from your knee to your ankle as well. So go through all this to get back. Then I get back and then they say, okay, you can play next week in the gray cup. We lose. Doesn't happen. I didn't work out after the season. I was dejected. Didn't work out until January and it had stiffened up and so much scar tissue and all the work that I'd done. It was, I was like so far removed from that and I couldn't run two days in a row. I couldn't work out two days in a row. It was a lot of pain. Um, I was going through rehab the whole off season and rehab helped, but it didn't get me nowhere close to where I needed to be. Um, coming into training camp, we had the short little stuff where um, the whole uh, contract stuff. Mm -hmm. So everything kind of played off that year in 2014. And I missed five games in 2014, had my first game without a catch because one of the players got hurt or the corners got hurt. And we had to take an American receiver out. I was hurting. So I came out and I really didn't play in the game. And that was the only game I never had a catch. And I only played, I think, 12 plays that game. Mm -hmm. So 
going through that whole season, my mindset was, I don't even know if I can ever play like I and I don't want to play just to play the game. I want to play and I want to dominate and I want to do what I do. Right. So just going through that whole mental aspect of back and forth, will I ever be healthy again? And talking to Huff and, and the staff and, and basically deciding that I was probably going to take a, you know, come on the coaching staff, got a call from Sask about a potential coaching job. And then March rolls around and, um, yeah, Jim Pop called me, asked me, did I want to come play? He was like, usually you're better two years after that injury, uh, that type of injury. And I was like, man, look, I don't know if I can, but I'll work, I'll work and I'll prepare myself best I can. And then we can see where it goes. He's like, cool. And yeah, felt great. And everything from then on was kind of like, was good. I, I definitely enjoyed it. It was definitely a a positive thing, not even just for football, for my life though. Like to hang around some of the guys I got to hang around in in, in uh in Montreal, like uh Tyrell Sutton and Brandon Rutley and John Bowman and BJ and SJ and um Billy Parker and all those guys, man, just a solid group of of men that I, I really enjoyed my time in Montreal. Yeah, before we you know talk about your time in Montreal, I wanted to, to track back just to the the 2014 Grey Cup for for a second because you know being being a Hamilton fan, that one that one stings a bit more than usual. When when it was Speedy Banks was returning the punt at the end, did you see the flag when it was thrown, or or did you think that you guys had actually lost the game and then you know just had a total 180 where you saw the the, the referee making the, the illegal block call? Well, I was probably about 10, 15 yards from it. And I seen uh, Taylor Reed push the guy right in the middle of the back. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, the reason they got to the Grey Cup, they had like three clips the week before on like two returns. Mm -hmm. And so, and as a coach, you do your study and then you, you make the officials aware of, of these calls and say, look, these guys are doing this. This is how they returned them. And it's it's very unfortunate to lose a game like that. I understand that, but I mean, with all with all due respect, it's it, there's still time on the clock. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I, I love Speedy B. But for him to not come back onto the field for his team at that moment is huge, mm -hmm. right? So the game is never over until it's over, and. You know, he basically ended the game right there. I know he felt let down by a clip or or whatever, but he let his team down at the same time. Yeah, it's it's hard. You know, I I, I can't even imagine. You know, the emotions that were going through on both sides of, of this of the field that you know that specific play, but the whole night in general. But I kind of got. I feel felt really bad for for Speedy just because you know he's such a competitive guy and he he just oozes out passion when he plays and, and to be you know. He he thought he just won the Great Cup for for Hamilton, who hadn't won it in, in probably what like fifteen or sixteen years at that time since ninety nine. Yeah, um, and you know just just you know the, the amount of you know heartache and just sadness he felt. I can't even imagine to begin what what it was, and you know I think it all just comes from you know football players in general are very competitive and very passionate about their sport, or else they wouldn't make it to the level they are. It's hard to make it you know professional level of a sport that is so dangerous and you know so fast paced. Uh, without that passion and competitiveness. So I think that just kind of, to me, at least watching, you know, the, the series of events, it kind of spoke to me on just how, how competitive football players are and how passionate they are. But again, like, like you said, there is still time on the clock. So that wasn't uh, one play in football. Does not make or break the game? A lot of people, a lot of people have that perception that, you know, one play makes or makes or breaks the game. And it's all because of that one play, but there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of play that go on in a single football game. Oh, of course. You know, and that was one of the things is like, he had a great opportunity to, to make a difference. And I mean, he did his job. It wasn't him that didn't do his job, but um, you can't, you can't not, not call that call. Right. It's right there in front of the returner. The guy's getting ready to take his shot on the returner. And, you know, we had some great special teams guys that year. And, you know, I believe Speedy never gets out of that corner without that block, right? It's right on his right hip, and the guy's going to take his shot. 
And if Speedy has to, if Speedy gets out of that, he's got to bubble so much, like he doesn't get that corner. Mm-hmm. So it, the block made a big difference, you know. And sometimes when when guys block on the other side of the field, or you get a hold in thirty yards away from a call that made no difference, or a clip that's questionable clip call that's right on the side, thirty yards from the play. Now I'm with you. I understand. Like, oh man, what are they doing? Mm-hmm. But when it's right there at the point of attack, you you have to make the call. What kind of advice would, would you give to, to different, not only football players, but athletes in general that maybe were in the same position that Taylor Reed was in for that specific play where, you know, they had a crucial penalty that, you know, just changed the course of the game. And it's only natural for football athletes, especially in the great cup. Um, to just feel so, so sad and, and just, you know, so down themselves and just, you know, getting that downward spiral. If an athlete came to you with a similar situation, what kind of words of advice or um, phrases, I guess, or sayings w- would you tell that athlete uh, to help them, you know, pick themselves back up? I mean, he's trying to win a game and he, he did everything he could to help. You know, I look at it two ways because if you don't get away with it the week before, then maybe that doesn't happen then. You know what I'm saying? So if yeah, you're yeah. getting away with something and it's not being called, like, of course, you know Speedy's going to have a chance to take everyone he catches to the house. So you just want to do your job. And, you know, sometimes you get beat. And when things like that happen, you just got to pick a shoulder and try to just put your butt on somebody and shield them and let Speedy outrun them with his speed. Uh, but he was just in a bad position and he got caught in a bad position and he sees the guy that he's supposed to be blocking about to make a play. And um, yeah, you know, if, if, if the, if refing was a hundred percent, you know, it'd be a lot different, but since it's not a hundred percent, that call gets, you know, it doesn't get the flag all the time. So, you know, like I said, he's just trying to make a play and trying to help his team out. So if Reffin was 100%, then, yeah, he's a, it's a bad job. But since it's not 100%, he thought he can get away with one. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, you know, kind of thinking of, of advice to give an athlete in that situation. One thing that I kind of talk about with some of the athletes that I consult with um, just on the side kind of thing is, you know, good, el- good you know, I guess good things that you do or the r- good decisions sometimes lead to the good outcome and sometimes lead to the bad outcome bad decisions sometimes lead to the good outcome, sometimes lead to the bad outcome. Like it's very, you know, vice versa and and wishy-washy and 50, 50. So in a case like this, you know, the week before it was a bad decision, which was a, you know, illegal block, for example, it doesn't have to be Taylor Reed. I don't want to pick on him here, but it could be any football player where, you know, one week they do a bad decision of a, you know, an illegal block comes up with a good outcome. The next week, the same bad decision, bad outcome. And I think really it's, it's just trying to, you know, find that middle ground of, 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 good, of good decisions and just realizing that sometimes good decisions lead to bad outcomes. doesn't mean that you stop doing the good decisions. And if bad decisions lead to good outcome, that doesn't mean you just keep doing the bad decisions. You really kind of got to bunker down and, and, and figure out a way to only make good decisions as much as you can. You know, that's easier said than done, I guess. I think it comes down to laziness, right? If you allow yourself to be lazy and one thing that's different about the CFL is there's so many starters on special teams. Mm-hmm. And when you have defensive starters on special teams, they're not used to blocking. They're used to tackling. They're used to doing these things. So when they get put in these situations, it's a reaction. And when you're lazy on your technique or you let a guy buy you and you're not doing the things properly because it's the fourth quarter, you're tired, but the game's on the line and you allowed your technique to fail. Therefore you were in a bad situation and not used to being in that situation because you're a defensive player, you reacted and your reaction was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think people think, Oh, I'm going to push this guy in the back. It's everything in sports is a reaction. So I just think that his technique failed him. And there's not, I don't want to just say he's lazy, but you know, there's part laziness in, in getting that job done. You can look at yourself and say, my returner can take this to the house. All I have to do is my job. 
you know, you don't have to do more than that. You just have to do your job. And that's what it comes down to doing your job. You get in a position to make the block. And if you're not in a position to make the block, just don't do it. And even if you go to the sideline where you don't make the block, I mean, you're starting at the 30 yard line. Instead, they started like the 15 or inside the 15. And then you took a sack on the first play and then you got up to almost midfield. So just that, just that perceptive right there, you could have been, you could have been down to, you know, the 30, 35 yard line on our side of the field without that block, even if you give up the tackle in special teams in Canada, uh, especially punt return, it goes from where the returner catches the ball. It doesn't go from the spot of the foul. Right. So, you know, most of those returns that get penalties like that end up being 40, 50 yard penalties. In that case, that ended up being what a hundred yard penalty. Yeah, pretty much. So that's, that's the difference. And that's where you have to really, understand your job and what you're trying to accomplish and defensive players have to focus in more because they're not used to being in those situations. Yeah. Another thing that I would kind of, you know, help, help, or, you know, try to tell athletes that were in similar situations or dealing with, you know, those things is to accept the mistakes that you make, not, not to try and make an excuse for them or rationalize them or forget about them. I think where there's a real value in athletes is accepting the mistakes you make and just using them as learning opportunities to, to better yourself moving forward. Because if you, if you don't accept that you made a mistake, there's nowhere to, to learn from it really. And you'll just keep repeating it over and over again. That's it. Um, I know, you know, a lot of people, they know you from your time in Calgary, but you know, obviously there's a couple of seasons in Montreal and then, you know, a year there in BC as a running backs coach. How weird was it to, you know, play against Calgary on the other side of the field or other side of the sideline as, as a coach? As a player or as a coach? For both. Yeah. We'll start oh, with the player. Oh, as a player, man, I, I loved it. And <laughs> I knew there was a measuring stick and it was one of those things where, we used to we used to go at it at practice. Me, Keon, Brandon Smith, uh, Jamar Wall, all those guys. Fred uh, Fred Bennett. Like we used to go at it. Even back when Brandon Brown was there, he used to guard me every day, and we used to have battles and fights and battles and battles and battles. Like practice on day three was so competitive in Calgary. Um, when I got to Montreal, I noticed it wasn't as competitive. And it wasn't as much trash talking because, you know, with me and Charleston and a lot of our, like a lot of our guys, Juwan Simpson, we're talking back and forth throughout the whole practice. Like it is a battleground. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing these situations and no huddle and things and they got to tag off on you and they're like, that's a tackle. I'm like, you know, you can tackle me right there. You barely touch me. And so once you get to the games and we play against each other, I said it, man. I was like, man, you get to get the Nick Lewis experience. <laughs> like, you get to experience what everybody else has been experiencing. You get to see if that really is a tackle now. And it was fun because we go out there to compete against each other. And Hank said something earlier today about, you know, everybody needs a rival and to bring up the greatness in you. And, you know, playing against those great teams at Calgary when I was in Montreal, it really helped elevate my level back to the level of, this is fun. This is, this is the rival. This is what I need. And this is the passion comes out. And I think in the two or three games I played against Calgary, I probably averaged a hundred yards in, in Montreal. Right. Right. They wouldn't give me the ball when we went to Calgary. And I was like, man, this is crazy. They must be paying them off because they're not giving me the ball when we in Calgary. But when I was in Montreal, I was, I was balling on them. Yeah. That's gotta be so common with athletes kind of, you know, it's gotta be a little bit weird at first, but so common that, you know, you spend so much time with the team and then you almost want to prove to them they made the wrong decision in a way, or you want to prove to them you still got it, or you prove to your old teammates that you still got it. Someone, you know, one, one case that really jumps out to me as you're speaking that about that was Brett Favre, you know, myself being a huge Packers fan to kind of sting a bit more, but you know, of course he was a legendary Packers quarterback and then he left to go to the Jets and then he went to the Vikings and he said he specifically went to the Vikings so he could play the Packers twice a year. I think it just comes again from just the competitive nature of football players in general where they have that motivation and, and that passion to show the world that, you know, the, that they can be the best that they are as an athlete and they want to prove it to those that, you know, might doubt them or might um, look down upon them, for example. 
No, mine came from just pure passion of having a great dance partner. Right. You know, I, I respect Brandon Smith so much and those guys and battling with him and everything. It was just like, I know today I need to be at my best in order to be my best. And when you have a good dance partner, you know, it makes beautiful music, right? So when you know that, like, it's hard to get up for games when you know you're just going to walk over somebody. Oh, we're going to win this game. And even in Montreal, even like we didn't win a lot of games, but you still see teams like, oh, this game shouldn't be too hard. Or this defense, oh, I can get off on this defense. It's not going to be hard. But Calgary, it was like, I'm going – it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to show them they made a, the wrong decision because they didn't. They made the right decision. Mm-hmm. You know, they shouldn't have paid me more money uh, to stay there because you didn't know if I was coming back the way, to be who I was. You didn't know these things. And me being the, one of the highest paid, if not the highest paid non-quarterback on the team, I, I respect their decision. I respect Huff and Dave and all those guys because it's it's all love, right? And it wasn't out of and a lot of and a lot of people do. They leave the team. They're like, oh, Tommy Campbell just left, you know, Montreal and just said, I got four dates circled on my calendar, <laughs> Calgary and Montreal. Right. So you, right. you understand how those things get, but for me, no, it was great. I I definitely enjoyed it. In it was just like it was more the thrill of having a great dance partner than the thrill of saying, Oh, I'm about to prove to y'all that I still, I didn't need to prove anything to anybody. Right. I was out there just having a blast, um, talking trash with the guys, having fun with them on the field. Uh, and yeah, just, ha- you know, when you know, you got that great dance partner, you know, when well, like back in the day when you had George Foreman and, and Ali, uh, right. You know, when greatness is there and you have to be great to, to experience that. Yeah. One thing that I talk about with a lot of athletes is the difference between like internal and external motivation. And it seems like you really had most or pretty much all of your motivation come from inside of you, just a passion for the game of, you know, just having fun playing the game rather than external, you know, proving other people wrong, money, fame, those things are on the outside. And I think as you know, for somebody to have such an illustrious and, you know, long careers as, as you did, you you pretty much need that internal motivation because if not that external motivation, it, it comes and goes, goes ups and down. But for the most part, you know, until you decide to hang it up, that internal motivation is, is there for the most part. I told you, man, I wasn't a big football guy. It wasn't like I was just a huge football fan. I love my number one thing in life is competition. I love to compete. And I love, I love competing against people that push me to be better and to try harder. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't, you know, that's, and that's the only thing I wanted to do was compete. I fell in love with it when I went to college and, and it's propelled me to this point and it's going to propel me for the rest of my life. And the game will never love you. I never loved the game. I know the game and I love to compete. And when you give me the chance to compete against some of the best athletes in the world, sign me up. Yeah, man. But before we sign off here, I know you mentioned it a bit before that, you know, as as football players, you always got to think about your second career after football because the money runs out eventually. And and not only that, but just, you know, life's kind of boring if you're doing nothing fun. I know you started your own podcast and you're on uh, the Rod Peterson Peterson show a bit. Tell the people, you know, a bit about your podcast, how they can reach it, how they can listen to you on on the Rod Peterson show. Yeah, man. It was, um, you know, going through coaching and, it was a lot of time I put in the coaching because I love it. Everything I do, I'm put passion in and cause I love to do it. I love to be around people. I felt like I should be reaching more people. I, I felt like I should be affecting more people in a positive way. Um, so I decided in December that I'm going to take this year off from coaching and build. Um, and I started off with my podcast called Lulu logic. And it's funny cause you know, me and my dad, I always, I always say that's Lulu logic and he always like, that's crazy logic. Right. Right. So, and it's just the way I think. Right. So I just, I just enjoy the opportunity. Uh, when I started the podcast, I, I knew a concept of what I wanted to do, but I didn't think it would go this well. And to be able to have on some old friends and, and some new friends and, and different CFL legends. Um, I have a baseball player coming up. Uh, on Thursday from ex uh, ex MLB baseball player, you know, some of the stories and the journeys that you hear, 
people just find them so relatable. Like, man, I went through something similar. Or, man, this is, like, I could have done that. And it's so true. It's like, get up. Like, never stop getting up. Never stop trying to be who you thought you wanted to be when you were a kid. Or if you redesigned that when you got older, go be who you want to be. Quit being stuck in your circumstance and your situation. You know, it's like an exit plan. What is your exit strategy from the life you don't want to live to the life that you want to live? And these people that I'm bringing on share so much wisdom and, and guidance. And they talk about failure. They talk about success. They talk about all the things that have created them to go out and do positive things and great things for others. And I think the best way to describe it is the first thing you should always do is be a service to to others, service other people. If you don't feel like you're worth it, service other people. It'll show you your worth in life. If you can get up every day, uh, do nice things for other people, be kind to people and, and just be a service to the people around you. So starting that and then um, then that led to um, the clothing line, uh, always bet on you. And that all ties into the same thing, bet on yourself to live the best life you want to live. And so now I have the podcast, Lulu Logic, which is on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addicts, and a few others. And it's also on my website, nicklewisvision.com. So it's just all about putting all this stuff together. And right now I'm working on two shows as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hopefully have some traction with that and yeah, just build, right. Just build, build, build. And yeah, it's it's crazy, you know, how much social media is part of culture right now. And you got to be present on social media to almost have any sort of, you know, I don't want to say relevance, but to really capture the attention of the people you want to talk to, you, you got to be active on all these social media platforms. So I, I think that, you know, what you're doing now is a great, you know, role model for other athletes that are retiring soon or even are in the league still because you're in the league doesn't mean you can't kind of do these things on the side or on the off season or something. So I really think it's important what you're doing to show other athletes how to make a second career after football is done or sports in general. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, if you're an athlete and you're listening to this, man, I'm working on something that could be very powerful, um, very beneficial to you as an athlete. And it's in my one year plan, right? I have a life coach that I've been working with now. And I did my one month plan, my three month plan, my six month plan, and my one year plan. So my one month plan went great in January, got the clothing line out and the podcast out. Now my three month plan, I'm executing it right now. Uh, six month plan is is something I'm looking forward to executing as well. But if all that goes well, my one year plan, it's going to be explosive <laughs> and it's going to be exciting. And yeah, if you're an athlete, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you and engaging with you and building with you. That's awesome, Nick. You know, I, I really appreciate you taking some time tonight. I know that uh, that Hall of Fame induction is coming sooner rather than later. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing that down the street here in, in Hamilton. But again, really pre- 2021, there it is. Just one more year. <laughs> yeah, one more year. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be good, man. I, I hope so. I'm very grateful for the opportunity and, and I hope it happens. And, and if it does or when it does, then I'm going to be very thankful. And, you know, um, Shout out to Pigskin Pete. Shout yeah. out to the Hamilton Ticat fans, man. I love those guys because they're they're great supporters of this wonderful league. And I can't wait to celebrate with you and the rest of the CFL fans because uh, if anybody ever knows, I've always represented the fans and uh, we will definitely go into this as the fans. Yeah. And I think, I think Hamilton's hosting the Grey Cup in 2021, if I remember correctly. It's, it's 21 or 22, one of the two for sure. I think, 21. It's tw- I think it's 21. Yeah. So that would be 21. That's got to be pretty special for the Hall of Fame class because, you know, the Grey Cup and, and the Hall of Fame are, are basically just down the street from each other. So that, that'd be a really special class. And, and I know, you know, like you said, you, you hope you get in and, 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 and whatever, but I think, I think it's a shoe in personally, but I'm not on the committee, so I can't make that decision. Yeah, it's it's going to be good, man. It's going to be good. I try not to think about it too much because it takes too much time off of the what I need to be doing up until that moment. Yeah. Um, but it's good. It's good to know that you recognize for uh, for the things that you did. 
For sure. For sure. Again, Nick, really appreciate you taking, taking some time tonight. And, uh, this was really fun for me. Really, really super cool to chat with, with a CFL legend like yourself. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, bro. And like I said, man, it's, it's my job to be able to, to do these things and to be able to help you and, and others in their, in their pursuit of the lives they want to build. So if I can be a vessel, then that's just what I am.